I had done a movie called Beloved, a book written by Toni Morrison. I worked on that movie for 10 years and then it came out and it bombed. For the longest time, when I would read people say, read that people had said it was a bomb, I would get like, oh, clutched because I couldn't even say the word bomb. I couldn't say it failed. It was, it felt like at the time, one of the biggest, you know, disasters of my career. It felt like the saddest thing. It sent me into depression. And what I learned from that experience is what we talk about in right. the book, is you take the, the thing that was the worst thing for you, the thing that was the challenge, and you begin to look at what it was that you really benefited or how you benefited from that thing. And what I learned from that beloved experience, because at the time that it bombed, I went into depression about it. My former depression was eating macaroni and cheese for breakfast every morning. And about 40 pounds later, I was talking to a friend and they were saying, so why did this take you down so? And I said, because I just wanted everybody to feel about that movie the way I felt about it. I wanted people to understand that you could be an enslaved person, come through that and still have love. And the person said to me, well, I felt that. I said, well, I actually wanted millions of people, <laughs> not, not, not just you. And then I decided that from all of my work going forward, and that was in 1998 when it bombed, I would no longer be attached to the work. I would allow myself to detach from it and just offer whatever I was doing, offer it. I say, this is what I'm doing. This is what I would love for you to receive it in the manner in which I'm giving it. If you don't receive that, then the joy for me was in the giving of it. This is the other thing I, I think that's really important that I've come to on my own. I just realized that you reach a point where you have to ask yourself, what is enough? What is enough? And, you know, I live a really huge life surrounded by, and it was actually a goal of mine when I was first doing the color purple in 1985. I remember writing in my journal then that if I ever get enough money, I want a house surrounded by beautiful things. And so I have done that. I have achieved that over and then over and then over. And I look around and I say, okay, you got enough. It's okay. I'm satisfied. I have all the things that I need. And so now I can focus on how do I take what I know, what I've gained, who I've become in the world, and how can I use that in service to other people in a way that makes them happier. And that for me, that's part of what this book is about. This is the thing. I remember years ago, during the beloved period actually, when I was being interviewed by a reporter and then about a decade later, I ran into the same reporter. I didn't remember her, but she remembered me. And she said, yeah, I remembered you. I interviewed you during the beloved. I said, oh, that was a time. And she said, but no, what I re realize is that you're the same person, you just have become more of yourself. And I thought, I actually think that's right. I think that one of the reasons why I am so proud of myself is not just because I escaped apartheid Mississippi and was able to get an education and become successful in life. It's because I have paid attention. I have paid attention. I am a great observer of my life and the lives of other people. And every day on that show, it was a classroom for people who were viewing, but it was a major classroom for me. And so I learned by watching other people's dysfunction, their struggles, their triumphs, celebrating in their joys, about the meaning of life and what it means to live a full and engaged life. And I learned that one of the most important things that everybody is looking for is to be validated to be seen and to know that they matter. And that no matter who you are, Barack Obama, the first time he came on the show as Senator, he finished the interview and said, is that good? Is that all right? Good for you? Beyonce, when she finished doing, teaching me how to twerk, said, was that all right? When I interviewed a, a woman who had lost three of her children to cancer, she said, did I do okay? And what I realized is in, in one form or another at the end of every conversation, people would say that. And I started to see the pattern and understood that what people really want is to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? 
and did what I say mean anything to you? And in recognizing that, I was able to become a better interviewer because I can give you that thing that you're looking for. I know how to help you be better in that seat, just as you're doing with us here today, be better in that seat and tell your story in a way that when you leave here, you got what you wanted. I would say be easy with yourself. Be easy with yourself. And it's all gonna work out because one of the primary, I think, principles that has led me to success is intention. And I think clarifying the intention based on the principles that we set out and the guidelines and manual work that we set out in the book, clarifying the intention, your reason for being. I mean, we talk in the book about asking yourself the question about what you're willing to live for and what you're willing to die for and getting clear on that because that is really the real work of your life. Everybody's going to find a job that's going to be able to bring you money and you're going to be successful. You're going to get all of that. But why were you really brought here by whatever means you think you got here? Why are you really here? You've come here to serve and you've come here to love. And how are you gonna use your service in love first and foremost to yourself? Because you got, the work is not to make yourself perfect, but to start to begin to make yourself whole. How are you going to do that? How do you fill yourself up to be a whole person, a full person of kindness, of grace and being able to offer that into the world along with all the wonderful skills you all are gonna have. How do you offer that into the world in service that lifts you up and allows you to meet the rising of your life and lifts other people up? And so changing the paradigm to how, not just what am I gonna do, but how am I going to serve? How am I going to serve? And my prayer for myself since I was a little girl was God use me, God use me. And whether you believe in my God or your God or no God, the question is how can you be used in service with all this work you're putting in, all this stuff that you're doing, you're doing that for what? You're doing that to be of service, first and foremost to yourself, your family and your community, and then how do you push that out into the world? And if the world is 20 people, 20,000 people, 20 million people as it was with me every day, it does not matter. Because what really matters is that you're building legacy. And this is the greatest definition of legacy I ever heard. When I opened my school in South Africa for <coughs> young girls, one of them is here today, who's now grown in law school and starting work in New York. But I opened that school for girls who were like me. I grew up in rural Mississippi, no running water, no electricity. My grandmother and I on what I thought was a farm and I went back and realized it was just an acre. It was so big in my mind, I went back, oh, this is, this is not a farm. This is actually <laughs> just a yard. When, when I was growing up there, I had a dream for myself. I remember being out with my grandmother washing clothes in a big iron pot, because we didn't have a washing machine, of course, and her putting clothes on the line and saying, you better watch me, because one day you're gonna have to learn how to do this for yourself. And I will tell you that the voice inside myself that all of us have, that feeling, that spirit, that inner voice, that voice at four years old said, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> This is not going to be my life. <laughs> but I had sense enough not to tell my grandmother. I, I had sense enough not to say that out loud, but I could feel inside myself, uh-uh, I'm not going to be doing this. And it turned out to be true. But what I do know now is what Maya Angelou told me about legacy. When I came back from opening the school, I said, Maya, School is going to be my greatest legacy. These girls are amazing. And I, I can't even tell you, the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy is going to be the great. She said, you have no idea what your legacy is going to be. I said, oh, no, I, I'm telling you, it's going to be these girls. You should have been there. You should have seen it. She was making biscuits at the time, and she put the dough down. 
When Maya puts the dough down, give back. She said, I said you have no idea what your legacy will be because your legacy is not your name on a building. Your legacy isn't even the lives of those girls. It's every life you touch. Your legacy is every life you touch and you are building your legacy here and now. So everything that you do going forward, every life that you encounter and experience and the way you treat yourself and the way you treat other people is building your legacy. So think about it in terms of the, the bigger goal and meeting the rising that is there waiting for you. And the fact that you've gotten here and all the things that you had to overcome means you've already won. So go forward, that's what I say. One of the challenges, especially when you're going through anything, is not allowing the emotions to take over you and to be able to separate the feeling from who you know yourself to be and being able to have that little space in between where you can be the observer of the feeling. When you can observe the feeling and not be absorbed by the feeling, you can feel it and then take the wheel for yourself. It's just like, you know, when I was eight years old, I memorized Invictus. And at the time I was reciting out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about at eight years old. But I did know that the last stanza, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, that had meaning for me even at eight years old. And so as I've grown into myself, become more of who I was meant to be, the mastery of that comes when you can separate those emotions and feelings from the who of who you are. So the Oprah Winfrey Show was on for 25 years, was the most successful television talk show in the history of all television. I did it for 25 years. Never missed a day. Never missed a day. And the reason it was the most successful is because around the second year of it, I changed the motivation and intention of the show. I went from just trying to be a talk show competing with everybody else in the rat race of ratings and literally sat down with my producers and said, how do we use this show as a force for good? How do we, and that came after doing three shows in a row. I'd done a show with the Ku Klux Klan and I realized in the middle of that show that I wasn't helping anybody. I thought I was exposing their vitriol when in fact they were using their appearance on the show to recruit other members. And so I could feel that going on in the audience. And then another show that we did with on people who had infidelities and a husband had come on with his with his wife and his girlfriend. The producers were so happy that they got the husband and the wife and the girlfriend. And in the middle of that show, the husband humiliated his wife and said, she's pregnant on national television. And when that happened, I was so ashamed that that had happened on my platform. I said, this will never happen to me again. And I will never do a show like the Klan again. And so my producers were like, well, what are we gonna do? I said, we're gonna, we're gonna turn this around and we're gonna, nobody bring me an idea that you are not clear about what the intention is. And we are gonna only do shows that come from the intention of how can we best serve the audience. And I'm telling you, after every show, there was a meeting to say, did we serve the intention? Did we do what we say we wanted to do? And how can we do it better the next time? And that is when the joy the happierness, the level of satisfaction, the level of pleasure, and everything changed for me in doing that show. And it also, when the numbers took off, all sort of happened at the same time, but it was because it was intentional and we were trying to use it as a service and not just as a show. My favorite quotes of all time is Martin Luther King, who says, not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And what I've found is no matter what it is you're doing for other people, no matter how tedious or menial the job may seem to you, that if you shift the paradigm of whatever your work is to how do I use this to serve? How can I be of service? Whether it's your art or your 
skills, your talents, whatever it is you're offering, if it is offered in service, the shifting of the paradigm to, I'm gonna use this to serve, makes a world of difference in the way you put that energy out into the world and the way that it comes back to you. That's what I learned from doing the show. My life is fueled by my being and the being fuels the doing. So I come from a centered place. I come from a focused place. I come from compassion, it's just, it's just my nature. I come from a willingness to understand and to be understood. And I come from wanting to, to connect. I mean, the secret of that show for 25 years is that people could see themselves in me. All over the world, they could see themselves in me. And even as I became more and more financially successful, which was a big surprise to me, I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. <laughs> got more than 30,000 by the time I was 30. So, but what, what I realized is through the whole process, because I'm grounded in my own self, that although I could have more shoes, my feet stayed on the ground, although I was wearing better shoes. So I could keep my feet on the ground, even though I could get more shoes. And I could understand, I could understand that it really was because I was grounded, was doing and continue to this day to do the consciousness work. I work at staying awake. And being awakened is just another word for spirituality, but spirituality throws people off and they think you mean religion. When I was hiring people for my company, looking for presidents, when people would come in, I'd say, tell me, what is your spiritual practice? And literally, people would oh, no, well, go, well, I'm not religious. Or I said, I didn't ask you about your right. religion. I asked you, what's your spiritual practice? What do you do to take care of yourself? What do you do to keep yourself centered? What do you do to the... And you know, one woman started crying, you know that's not the person. Everything is fueled that comes from me really wanting to be a better person on earth. And this is what I know to be true. The reason why the show worked is because I understood that audience, my viewers, the people who watched us every day and would come and just like you all did, get tickets and they would come with their family. You all just came across campus, but that's good too. People would come from all over the world just to be there with their aunts and their mothers and they'd come with their cousins and there'd be a few men in there going, what the hell? Or saying, well, I went to Oprah with you. I went to Oprah and I ought to at least give me clear for three or four weeks, I went to Oprah with you. I had such regard for that. And I just had a conversation with John Mackey who runs Whole Food and has written this fabulous book, you should get it called Conscious Capitalism. And he was talking about how the investment in the stakeholders, the people who you are serving, that connection between the people who you're trying to serve and sell to is equally as important as the people who you're buying from, right. equally as important as the people who are you know, supporting you financially as your stockholders if you are, you know, you know, a public company. So I always understood that there really was no difference between me and the audience. At times I might have had better shoes, but at the core of what really matters, that we are the same. And you know how I know that? Because all of us are seeking the same thing. You're here at this fabulous school and we'll go out into the world and each pursue based upon what you believe your talents are, what your skills are, maybe your gifts are, but you're seeking the same thing. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's what you're looking for. The highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. And because I understand that, I understand that if you're working in a bakery and that's where you want to be, that may be what you've always wanted to do is to bake mm -hmm. pies for people or bake cakes for people or to offer your gift, then that's, that's for you. And there's no difference between you and me, except that's, how, that's your platform, mm -hmm. that's your show every day. So my understanding of that has allowed me to, to, to reach everyone. And, and there's no way that you wouldn't, because that's, that's what I truly feel.